adore you. Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to have you with us, especially if you're visiting with us this morning. You are so welcome. It's good to have you. Uh, I've been looking forward to today for a long time. And when I say a long time, the whole week, because really this week started terribly. We got that midnight phone call uh, on Monday night to say Melissa's husband had passed away. He had the flu, and then he got a headache, and then he died. It was terrible. And so our hearts have really been pouring out to, to that family. And uh, man, thank you to this incredible family who just rallied to help them. You're just an amazing church family. What an honor it is to be part uh, of you. Of course, Melissa and her family are from Zimbabwe. I believe they're going back there tomorrow. And uh, thank you for all who have made uh, financial contributions to that. If you would like to make a cash donation rather than what the EFT that we put in the bulletin, we've, I've asked Craig to leave this, uh, this contribution little bag uh, here this morning. So when we go for a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, um, you'd like to, to help that family. They, the, you know, it's just it's an immense amount of money to repatriate your husband to Zimbabwe for the family, uh, for, for, for the funeral. So if you can help, that would be great. So what an honor it is just to come wash all that. Our singing has been just awesome this morning. And I just love the way that we've gone through the, the, the decades. And um, maybe next time I lead singing, I'll take you back to my era. 1923, you know, so we can sing some of those songs. Really, you know those songs from the, those, you know, uh, on a hill far away, you know, like we, we know those songs. Um, folks, it's time to eat again. Don't you think so? So uh, not next Sunday, the end of the last Sunday of the month, we're going to have a fellowship meal. Yeah. The reason is... Uh, we don't have a reason. We just, we just, like, we just like to eat. So uh, we're going to do that at the end of the month. We do it at the end of the month. You've just been paid. So therefore, really doesn't bring, you know, like the, the, the Mari biscuits and Marmite. You can bring crayfish and, and, and the, the rest of it. So, so we're going to do that. It's nice to have a fellowship meal. Stay. Enjoy a meal. Let's get to take time to get to know each other. Unfortunately, COVID hurt us in that way. You know, gone all the family retreats and all those wonderfuls and the sing songs, all those things we, we used to do. We don't get time just to, we get to worship, but that doesn't, you sit shoulder to shoulder, you know, back to someone, doesn't get a chance. How are you doing? How are you really doing? Look into somebody's eye. And when we sit and we have a meal together, it makes a difference. And that's why every major in fact, all celebrations, feasts from the, when you call them feasts from the Old Testament, you know, whether it's Passover, a Feast of Tabernacles, or, or uh, all of those, Yom Kippur, they all revolve around a meal. So we're going to have a meal that day. Hope that you will stay. Bring something, whatever you can bring, finger foods, and uh, we will get to share together. Folks, you're invited if you saw the bulletin. By the way, if you don't get the bulletin, if you're not on the WhatsApp, you, on, on our WhatsApp group, you need to give me your, your name and your number. I will gladly add you to our WhatsApp. That's the way we share our bulletin these days. And uh, it's in there. You're invited to the School of Preaching, our, our campus opening in Waterfall. That's happening on a Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m. It's going to be an hour ceremony. We're going to have a meal afterwards. If you're going to come, please let me know for catering purposes. I'd hate for... I hate to have to ask you to stand in the corner while we all eat the crayfish and stuff like that. So, so um, no, please just let me know if you're going to. We'd love to, to have you if, you if you can. And then, uh, yes, we're back into our adult Bible studies this morning. I hope that you can stay. We're into the book of Philippians. We're putting the joy back into rejoice. And I think you're going to really enjoy that study together. So today we get into the second part of how the resurrection gives us hope. I want you to think about this, that Jesus died age 33. So we say 33 AD, Jesus died. How many followers did Jesus have at that time? Well, we are not sure exactly, but can we say around about 120 for you, for those of you who know the scriptures around that, around about 120. And of course, when they had Jesus on the cross, everybody just, everybody just disappeared. But now, 2,000 plus years later, it's said that 2.3 billion people acknowledge Jesus as Lord. 2.3 billion. 
Folks, that's mace, that makes it out as one out of every three people who walk this earth claim Jesus as Lord. Now I know the Bible says not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But this is a staggering statistic. How did we get from 120 followers to 2.3 billion people? Take the population of China, add it to the population of Europe, add it to the population of the USA. The Christian movement is bigger than all of that. Isn't that just amazing? And I'll tell you what it was. The resurrection changed absolutely everything. How come the Christian movement is now the biggest organization on the earth? How did this happen? How, how, could, how could 12 poor fishermen and tax collectors and a few other things get so excited about the gospel that they just couldn't help it just bubbled out of them after Jesus rose from the dead. And now, uh, you know, when you go and read in the Old Testament and you read in the New Testament, things were dated by the, by the emperors in the, in the time of Augustus, Caesar, whatever. But now we, everything is dated according to Jesus Christ. Every single day, your birthday is in relationship to Jesus. Baby born in a stable, humble beginnings, Nazareth, carpenter. And really the swing of things didn't get going until he was 30 years old. And boy did it get going. And then they thought they had Sorted it out, did the Romans. They put him on a cross at 33, and they thought that was the end. They didn't begin to imagine that would only be the beginning. And so Jesus splits history into two, into B.C. and into A.D., and it was all because of the resurrection. So part two this morning, number one, because of the resurrection, because the resurrection gives us hope, number one, we've been completely forgiven completely forgiven you know people love that people love that around the world jesus repeatedly said i'm going to die on the cross for your sins read with me ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 once again uh this week i'm going to be reading some passages from the international children's bible in christ we are set free by the blood Remember, there can be no forgiveness of sins without blood being shed. That was God's decree. And that's why he gave his sons, so no longer do we have to sacrifice bulls, goats, and other animals. In Christ we have been set free from the blood of his death, and so we have the forgiveness of sins because of God's rich grace. Now, uh, Philip very capably read from Isaiah chapter 53 this morning. This is a prophecy. Look at Isaiah. Now, Wednesday night, if you join us on Wednesday night, we look at how Isaiah gets to glimpse into, into the throne room of heaven. And this was the prophecy that was given to Isaiah 700 years before Jesus even set foot on this earth. It's staggering. All of us are strayed away like sheep. We've left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him. Who's him, Jesus? Uh, him, Isaiah? Well, it's Jesus. But hang on, he hasn't been born yet. That's still 700 years. Isaiah knew this God laid this on his heart. Yet the Lord laid on Jesus the guilt and sins of us all. From prison and trial, they led him away to his death. But who, would, who among the people realized that he was dying for their sins and suffering their punishment? Folks, this is staggering. If you ever, maybe you came here this morning, you have a little bit of doubt about this Christianity stuff. How do you deal with this? How do you deal with the man that history knows? Not just Christian history, everybody, historian knows. A man by the name of Isaiah. And he writes this 700 years ago. 
I want you to imagine trying to prophesy something happens 700 years in the future. Not just general stuff. Names, places, events, somebody going to jail for somebody else's sins. Can only be a God thing. We carry on reading. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. Then he was put in a rich man's grave. How did you know, Isaiah? God told me. But it was God's plan that he should suffer. Then when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have a multitude of children. You know this morning, you are a child of prophecy. We are one of the multitude of children for whose sins Jesus died. I mean, even he was put in a rich man's tomb. How did you know? Isaiah, he was 700 years before this happened. God told me. The rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. We're part of that story today, folks. We have been completely forgiven. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. Jesus was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised from the dead to make us right with God. You've messed up, right? You've sinned? Welcome to the club. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Therefore, all deserve to die, but thank, to, thank be to God. He made it right because he sent Jesus. I'll die for you. Number two, number two, we're talking about how the resurrection gives us hope. We're no longer afraid to die. You know the fear of death? It's a universal thing. And the reason people fear death, they don't know what's on the other side. But when you know what's on the other side, you would, you would happily go through that. That's why the Apostle Paul said, but yeah, give me death. I'm happy to die because I know what's on the other side. But you know what? I'll hang around because kind of the church needs me. John chapter 11 and verse 25, New Living Translation. Jesus promised, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die. Like everyone else, they will live again. Man, you know what? If Jesus can raise, if God can raise the dead, if he can raise Jesus, he can raise us too to eternal life. And, and if, if God can raise the dead, he can raise your dead marriage. He can raise your dead job. He can raise your dead finances. We've, we've got a God who rose from the dead. He is the authority of life again. And, and it's so important because if there's no resurrection, if there's no Easter Sunday, if you want to couch it in terms we can understand, there is no hope. Because on Friday, there in Jerusalem, when they hung on the cross, there's 12 very depressed disciples and they were beginning to, to talk to each other and saying, well, if they did this to the leader, which of us is next? Which of us is, again, going to be hung on a cross? Even though we're, we're not guilty. But when Jesus walked out of that grave, man, they were just incredibly emboldened. In fact, history tells us only the apostle John died a natural death. But none of the rest cared. They weren't going to shut up for anything. They were just so excited to share Jesus. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. Here's a paraphrase. When we told you about the powerful coming of the Lord Jesus, we were not telling you made-up stories that someone invented. Rather, we, this is Peter speaking and the other apostles, we were our witnesses of his majesty. We were our witnesses of his majesty. It's Sunday morning. The macabre death of Jesus on Friday had taken place. The burial in the tomb was over. 
And Saturday must have been one of those unreal deaths. People not even feeling like eating. And then Sunday morning came. And a lady by the name of Mary Magdalene. She was Mary of Magdala. That's where she came from. She went to pay her respects. Like we all, we visit gravestones. We visit where our forefathers have gone. And she goes to the tomb. And the stone is rolled away. And that's where the ball started rolling. Man, she encounters Jesus. She runs and tells Peter and John. If you remember, they ran back to the tomb. You've got to be talking on. They ran there. And in fact, in John's account, he says, I ran out, out ran Peter. I, I, I'm faster than him. Maybe he's an old buddy. I don't know. But then... Folks, it spread like that. Jesus started to appear to different people. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. For 40 days after his death, Jesus appeared to people many times in many ways that proved beyond doubt that he was alive. They saw him and he talked with them about the kingdom of God. What? We, we, we were there. We saw you on the cross. You know, we, were, we went to the grave when they put you in there. Okay, we stood back in the crowd because we feared the Romans. But we were, we were there. We saw you die. There was no doubt about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this famous chapter uh, in, in the Bible, written by the Apostle Paul, I remind you, who was not there in the beginning, who was not there as one of the first apostles chosen. He was one untimely born as an apostle. Christ died for our sins, he said, just as the scripture said, he was buried and then he was raised from the dead on the third day. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12 apostles, I'm going to show you something that you might not have never seen before in this passage of scripture. Did Paul ever see Jesus? Did Paul ever see Jesus? Let's read. Before you answer, let's read. Otherwise, you might be shocked. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive. You don't believe me? Go and talk to them. Go and talk to them. They're still alive. Some people have died, okay? Since between Jesus died and now I'm writing this letter to you in Corinth. Though some have died by now. Then he was seen by James. Who's James? Jesus' brother. His very young brother. I mean, who was really not a big fan until after the resurrection. And later by all the apostles. All the apostles got to see Jesus. Last of all, I saw him too. Three times in the scriptures we're going, to, we're going to read about Paul saw the resurrected Jesus. It's quite a staggering thing. You know, we know that he was there when Stephen was stoned, but we don't know about him there with Jesus. But he witnessed Jesus as the resurrection follows. And, and there, and so Jesus is appearing, you know, to to. 500 at once, and to many others at other time. And in a blink of an eye, we've got going for 10, to hundreds, to thousands, to tens of thousands of followers. They've witnessed something that is beyond belief. They've never seen this in their life before. And all of a sudden, oh, Isaiah prophesied this. Isaiah said this would happen. Number three, we now have God's spirit inside of us. Ephesians chapter 1, 19 and 20. I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him. I pray that you would begin, folks, because we'll never understand it fully. We kind of just get a, a little grasp of it. Paul said, I really want you to understand that you've got God's power to work within you. It is that same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. 
And then uh, I, now you know why there's two scriptures on one page, because I thought of this late last night, and then I bombed this other scripture in. One of my favorites, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us. How's that happen? Through his spirit who lives in us. He's able to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So when you pray and you ask for something, and you think about something, and you think your prayers are so big, <laughs> God says, you've got to be joking. Come on now. Just try and think infinitely more you can ask or think. That's God's power at work within our lives. Number four, number four. God will never, ever stop loving us. You know, we live in a world of conditional love. We live in a world of conditional love. Love. Conditional love is all around us. I love you if you love me. I love you when you perform. I love you when you win. I love you when you get the trophies or when you reciprocate. I love you when you obey. But Jesus says, I love you anyway. I love you anyway. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 4, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I've loved you with an everlasting love. God said Daniel, uh, David was a man after his own heart. God loved David. God loved David when he was a shepherd boy, when he was killing bears, and he was killing lions, and when he was running away from Saul. God loved David when he was slaying giants. But I want you to know this morning, God loved David even when he was committing adultery with another man's wife. God never stopped loving David. Disappointed? Absolutely. But God never stopped loving him. John chapter 3, you know it well, this passage of scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, whoever, Believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I want you to remember this. This is really, really important. The first time God sent Jesus to the earth, Jesus came in love. The second time Jesus comes, it's going to be in judgment. It's really important to understand that. Because grace and forgiveness will only be available at the judgment for those who are in Jesus Christ. There's a condition to God's grace and his mercy on his judgment. Because the scriptures tell us all spiritual blessings are in Jesus Christ. If you're out of Jesus Christ, they're not available to you, John chapter 13, I'm giving a new commandment. Love each other just as I've loved you. Well, love has always been there. Oh, new commandment, just as, just as, just as I've loved you. I know you've been told to love before, but now this is different love. You love one another just as I've loved you, unconditional. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That's why the day of the birth of the church, I mean, it was just an explosion of Pentecost. 3,000 people saying yes to Jesus, being baptized. A couple of chapters later, 4,000, 5,000 people just flock into Jesus. They've never seen such love in all their life. We go uh, from John's gospel to his letters. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, verse 11. This is how we know that we are children of God. Who are the children of God? Or anyone who does not obey God's commandment and does not love others is not a child of God. Flat. There it is. This is the message we've heard from the beginning. You must love each other. Number five, our penultimate point this morning. We know the purposes we are created for. God's got a purpose for your life. He's got a purpose for my life. And when you align your life up with God's purpose, it becomes the life and the abundant life. 
Psalm 138 verse 8, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me because his, his love endures forever. Really nearly want to break out in this song. His love endures forever. Jeremiah chapter 29, that exile prophet, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord to Jeremiah. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope. And a future. How incredible to know that we, we've got a hope and a future. And John chapter 10 and verse 10, my purpose is to give you life and to and, and, and uh, life in all its fullness. Romans 8:28, we know that all things work together for good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. You hear this morning, you understand this. You've been called according to the purpose of God. Let's move to Mark chapter 8 and verse 35. If you insist on saving your life, if you think you can do it your way, you will lose it. Only those who throw away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the kingdom of the good news will ever know what it means to really live. Wednesday night we looked at some of the heroes of this life. The Mick Jaggers, if you remember, you were with us on Wednesday night. A man who's, who's worth nine billion rand. And yet he wrote a song, I can't get no satisfaction. Never knew Jesus. Our final point this morning, and we'll close. Number six, we have an eternal home waiting for us because of the resurrection. That's why it gives us hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and no mind has begun to imagine the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. So folks, we stand here, we worship here this morning as those redeemed by Jesus because we have identified with Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection in baptism. And so we, like Paul, can say, Maranatha. You know what Maranatha means? It means, come, Lord. Come, Lord. We don't fear death. The resurrection has given us hope. Man, if we live, we die, we do it all to the glory of God. And, and you know, we just like, we just say, Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's stand together as we sing together.